Halloween 6 takes place six years after we last saw Michael Myers being broken out of jail with the help of the mysterious Man in Black. We learn that the official story was that Michael and Jamie were killed in the explosion, and Haddonfield has banned Halloween celebrations ever since. But I think the most exciting aspect of this movie is that we get to see how Michael is handling the 90s. Spoiler alert, he's not doing well. Michael's going through some shit. Halloween 6 begins with Tommy Doyle giving us a rundown of Michael's life. One by one, he killed his entire family until his nine-year-old niece, Jamie Lloyd, was the only one. Now, I know this series likes to retcon a lot of events from previous installments, but this is straight up gaslighting at this point, because while Michael killed a lot of people, the only family member he ever killed was his sister Judith. And also, whomever this baby is, this is probably their only acting credit, and if the Nevermind baby can sue, then this baby would have a slam dunk case. At least Nevermind was good. Jamie Lloyd has just given birth in some kind of underground cult cave, and after following Danielle Harris's fantastic portrayal of Jamie Lloyd, the character gets recast for the thrilling conclusion because everyone involved in the Halloween franchise up to this point really knows what the audience wants. A nurse helps Jamie and her baby escape the ancient factory, but then the nurse runs into the evil Michael Myers. Hello, Lori's daughter, secret underground midwife. So a little birdie informed me that you were the one who microwaved salmon in the break room. Do you know how hard it is to get that smell out, Barb? It took me several hours, and now I feel like that smell is in my mask. But you don't care about that, do you, Barb? Oh, I can stink up whatever I want. Old janitor Mike will take care of it. I am not your servant, Barbara. We are co-workers, and you need to learn that. I know you're on your break, but we need you on the third floor ASAP. We got a toilet overflowing, and it's a real mess up there. Just a sea of piss and shit. And with Jacob being on vacation, we need you to help pick up the slack, bud. <sighs> How does Jacob have so much vacation time built up? He was hired two years after me. I hate this job. Jamie makes her way outside and slips through the fence with Michael in pursuit behind her. She then steals Jake the Snake Robert's truck and drives away. Everyone in Haddonfield is listening to Back Talk, the nationally syndicated trash radio show hosted by shock jock Barry Sims. Barry is going to do his show live from Haddonfield on Halloween night, and he's taking calls about Michael Myers. Uh, I, I know this may sound crazy, Barry, but I really think I'm in love with him. He's so untamed, so uninhibited. He's everything I've ever wanted in a man. Now, don't listen to her, people. She is only saying that because she saw Michael's Say You Will video. Look, people, that was misleadingly edited to make Michael look sexy and mysterious. If you run into Michael Myers, he will try to rip your throat out through your butt. One of the callers is Tommy Doyle, played by Paul Rudd in his first film role. I mean, technically Clueless was released first, but Halloween was filmed way before that. And Tommy Doyle was the little boy that Laurie Strode was babysitting for in the original Halloween, and he's been obsessed with Michael Myers ever since. I was only eight years old when I saw him, but I was one of the lucky ones. Michael's work isn't done in Haddonfield, and soon, very soon, he'll come home to kill again. And if there are any struggling actors out there wondering if they can ever make it, just know that this was Paul Rudd's first acting gig, and he is now one of the most beloved actors working today. So trust me, you can get better. We also find that Loomis didn't die at the end of part six, and he's now a hermit living in a remote cabin in the woods when he's visited by Dr. Terrence Wynn, the chief administrator of Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Jamie makes it to a bus station and calls into Barry Sims' radio show to plead for help. Is calling into Backtalk the only way people can communicate in Haddonfield? Now, who's coming? It's Michael. Michael Myers. Loomis and Tommy are both listening, and it's actually a really cool scene, which could set up a pretty awesome rescue mission, but the people making this movie don't want anything to be seen as even remotely cool. Michael is still right on Jamie's tail, so she takes off again, and he causes her to crash. Jamie stumbles her way into a barn, and Michael impales her on farm equipment. Now, we have been following the character of Jamie Lloyd for two movies now, and just like that, she's dead. No real character growth or arc to speak of. She's now just another body that Michael had to mangle on his way to the next body, which means that we are definitely in a Halloween movie. At least the mask doesn't suck so much this time. It's about as close to the original as we're ever gonna get, so, I mean, that's a plus right there. I guess mask technology had finally evolved by 1995, so you could make masks that kind of resembled other masks. Like, what a waste of a good character. They should have just let Loomis shoot Jamie at the end of part four if they were never gonna do anything interesting with her whatsoever. Like, at the end of four, she was basically the new Michael Myers, only to have him just forget all of that and have her be a victim again in part five. Like, she should have been Michael's sidekick all through the fifth one, and she then has to have some kind of heroic redemption 
redemption in part six where she finally kills Michael and herself in order to save her family. But sure, dead in a barn is also a thing that can and did happen. We then get to Halloween in Haddonfield, and even though it's clearly the morning and Halloween has been banned, people are seen taking their kids trick-or-treating. And that's the kind of attention to detail we've come to love and expect from this series. Speaking of attention to detail, John Strode and his family have just moved into the third iteration of Michael Myers' childhood home. John is the brother of Lori's adoptive father and is an alcoholic prick who lives there with his kind wife Deborah, his ding-dong of a son Tim, his daughter Kara, and her son Danny. An argument at the breakfast table causes John to slap Kara and Danny pulls a knife on him. Now we've all thought about pulling a knife on our grandpas and Danny's out here just living it. Tim's girlfriend Beth shows up and oh my god what the f*** was that? That's not how you use jump scares. Jump scares are supposed to be used during an intense scene and the jump scare releases the tension and tries to lull you into a false sense of security so they can hammer you with the real scare. Like they were just having a conversation in the middle of the day. You absolute psychos. Tim and Beth are excited about the arrival of Barry Sims so they can propose their plan to bring Halloween back to Haddonfield. Tim is especially excited and he and Danny are wearing Barry kicks ass shirts. And so in honor of Halloween 6, I sent my intern Jerry to have 5,000 Barry kicks ass shirts to provide my awesome viewers and damn it, Jerry. What the hell, man? What? They said I had to sign for it. And then did you sign on the order form itself? Well, I don't know. You did. It was a rhetorical question. I already knew exactly what happened. Well, if you or anyone you know knows someone named Jerry who would love a Jerry Kicks Ass shirt, there's the link. Tommy is analyzing the recording of Jamie's call at the radio station, and he hears the intercom at the bus station and goes to investigate, and he finds a trail of blood that leads to the bathroom where he finds Jamie's baby in a cabinet and takes him home and names him Stephen. Loomis and Wynn are told that Jamie Lloyd was found murdered, and when they go to the barn, they find the mark of thorn burned into the hay bales. The Strode kids arrive at the college and... Did you really ride like that the whole way? You're not the grand marshal of a parade, Tim. Kara is looking for her term paper when she discovers a drawing that Danny drew, which shows their whole family being stabbed to death, including Kara. Now, if my son pulled a knife on my dad and I then found this picture in my bag, I would see that as nothing other than a threat, and I would not turn my back on my son ever. I think it's cool. Is, is Tim doing a butthead impression? Shut up, Bevis. Shut up, Tim. Tommy takes the baby to the hospital where he runs into Dr. Loomis and asks him to meet him at the campus rally later on that night. Ah, uh, home sweet... What the hell? This place is still a dump. And, and what happened? Last time I was here, this place was a freaking palace. Well, if I'm gonna be living here again, there are gonna be some major changes. Deb is trying to do laundry when the washing machine breaks down and she starts to get the feeling that someone might be in her house. <laughs> okay... Why the hell are you in her house, Loomis? He tells her that he's there to help her family, but this is still a stranger who just let himself into your home, Deb. This force, this thing that lived inside of him came from a source too violent, too deadly for you to imagine. It, it grew inside him, contaminating his soul. I can't believe you haven't seen the mask. It's much darker than people realize. This house is sacred to him. He has all his memories here. Well, maybe not this house. I've been here several times and nothing looks familiar. Michael's house could possibly be up a few streets from here, but, but really this whole area of Haddonfield is sacred to him. And Danny's walking home when he sees a mysterious man in black and- Jesus! Really? Deb calls John to tell him what Loomis told her about Michael and she's angry with him because she knows that he kept that information from her. She packs a suitcase and is getting ready to leave when she's freaked out because the axe that she brought inside is now missing. Deb then gets a call from someone saying they want the child and she notices Michael in her house. <sighs> Deb, do you know where the stepladder is? I checked the garage and basement, but of course it's nowhere to be found. Big surprise, someone didn't put something back where it belonged. And Deb has no clue where the stepladder is, and so she takes off. And luckily for Deb, she has her Sacconi flyers on. They're guaranteed to make matronly women run faster and jump higher. Uh, okay, Deb, pull it together here. I was just talking you up, woman. Well, we had a house meeting, Deb. And I'm afraid you're the first to leave. Kara comes home and finds her son in his room with Tommy Doyle, who is holding a baby, and he convinces her to go back to his place to talk about Michael. This family will talk to any random dude who just shows up at their house. Oh, hey, Daddy. You left your dinosaur toys all over the living room, bud. It's a real disaster in there. And guess what? I'm not going to be the one to clean it up. Whoa! 
I'm rolling down a hill. Tommy then begins to teach Kara about runes that were used in pagan rituals. The rune of the thorn was believed by the druids to represent a demon that spread sickness and brought death to hundreds of thousands. And any child that was cursed with thorn had to offer the blood sacrifices of its next of kin on Samhain to spare the lives of the rest of the tribe. So if all Michael had to do was just kill the last of his bloodline, why go through all the trouble of impregnating Jamie to give birth to a child to be Michael's final sacrifice? Like he spent two movies trying to kill Jamie and had he succeeded, then the ritual would just be complete. Why didn't they just allow Michael to kill Jamie at any time or the last six years? I'm starting to think this movie doesn't know what it's doing. And Tommy goes to the Halloween rally to meet up with Dr. Loomis, while their neighbor, Mrs. Blankenship, begins to tell Danny about the history of Halloween. People danced, and they played games, and they dressed up in costumes, hoping to ward off the evil spirits, especially the boogeyman. I mean, that's why I did it. No evil spirits were going to start shit when I was in costume. Uh, and the jean jacket was unfortunately part of every Halloween costume because it was always cold as shit. Mrs. Blankenship tells Kara that Danny hears the voice just like Michael did, and she says that she was babysitting Michael that night that he murdered his sister. <laughs> so you're saying that you were a terrible babysitter. And she says that the voice told him to murder his family. John shows up back home pissed drunk and the power goes out, and when he hears the washing machine still running, he opens it to find bloody clothes. Hello, Lori's adoptive father's brother. It appears your washing machine is off balance and it sprung a leak. I have this honey do list that Deb left, but I'm afraid the washing machine is at the bottom of the list of priorities in this money pit. I'm waiting on a number of quotes, but I suggest you just go to the laundromat in the meantime. I mean, I'll go to the laundromat because you'll be dead. Barry Sims shows up to the rally and I immediately question his kick-ass credentials. But Michael Myers is long gone. There is no boogeyman. Whoa! Does she get this riled up in the sack, Tim? I bet she wears crotchless panties and barks like a dog. Beth! What do you say, honey? You and me. You know what's funny is that Loomis listens to the Barry Sims show. I can just imagine Loomis cracking up when Barry's describing two women mud wrestling in the studio or something. And oh no, it looks like Destiny's Tiggo Bennies have been freed from their bondage. <laughs> oh, you're the man! Hey, Brittany, if there's no spots to sit in the studio, let me make a spot on my face. <laughs> Oh, Barry, you are terrible. Beth then lets it slip that Tim lives in Michael's old house. Just look at Tim's family. They live in the Myers house. You do? And Tim somehow has no idea, and Barry says that he wants to go broadcast from Michael's childhood home. But as soon as Barry gets in the van, Michael's already inside waiting and murders him. And so the Curse of Thorn says that Michael has to kill his bloodline and radio shock jocks. The curse is very specific about killing anyone who has the same blood as you, and anyone who has uttered the phrase, Don't touch that radio dial as we cruise on into the drive at five. What you said before about Michael Myers living in our house, is that really true? <laughs> All right. Tim is an idiot. Like, this is the only thing Haddonfield is famous for. And like, at the beginning, little kids put up a Michael Myers thing right in front of the house. Everyone knows this is Michael Myers' house. Tim and Beth have sex, and Tim goes to shower up. Hey Beth, can you bring a towel in here? I'm freezing! Okay, it's a little damp still. I think I have the washing machine figured out, but now the dryer's on the fritz. I swear this house is just falling apart around us. Tim! I just cleaned that mirror! You are just going to leave- Freak! Kara tries to call the house and Beth picks up, and just then Michael shows up right behind her. Oh sure, just light a thousand candles, Beth. It's no big deal if the whole house goes up in flames. It is like living with disrespectful pigs. Michael murders Beth and Kara sees Danny walking into the Myers house. Kara finds him in an upstairs bedroom. Look, you guys, I've got to be up at five to make it to Thorn Industries by six. I need to get some sleep, so please keep it down. You know, 20 damn people live in this house and no one works in- well the hell left their roller skates at the top of the stairs? <laughs> Property of Tim, hands off, this means you. Of course they're Tim's. Of course they are. Kara and Danny run across the street where Loomis and Tommy are waiting, and just then Wynn shows up and we learn that he's the leader of the Thorn Cult. And oh! Okay. All the time in horror movies, I'm always saying that I would just jump out the damn window, but that looks like something I would die from, or at least be very injured, so maybe I wouldn't jump out a window. And in a jarring bit of editing, Loomis and Tommy are revealed to have just come to after being drugged. I feel like I've been drugged. And, yeah, I, I said that. 
and Kara, Danny, and Stephen have all been taken by the Thorn cultists. Loomis and Tommy head to Smith's Grove Sanitarium where Kara and Danny are being held. Loomis gets knocked out by Wynn when he refuses to join him, and Tommy goes searching for Kara and tries to free her from her cell. What, what the hell are you doing? I have keys for that. Who do you think's gonna fix that door? Jacob? Because guess what? Jacob's not here. It's just me. Tommy and Kara find Dr. Wynn preparing for surgery when Michael comes walking in. Oh, Jiminy Christmas, I do not get paid enough to put up with this shit. But it looks like a family of raccoons got cooked alive when they fired up the furnace. It is an awful mess. Jacob's not back yet, so I'm gonna need you to take care of it for me, bud. That is it! I have had it with this job. And then Michael personifies the term rage quitting. Fred, 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 I'm gonna get you, little buddy. I know it was you who's been flushing baby wipes down the men's room toilet, Fred. If you have that much trouble wiping your ass, then maybe we should just install bidets. Tommy, Kara, and Danny hide in a room and lock the door, and they find the remains of all the failed experiments. Oh, what have we here? It's a locked door. However shall I get in? Watch closely, Tommy. I'm gonna use this new invention called a key. But why isn't this key working? Oh my god, this place is such a dump. Okay, fine, whatever, I had to bust through the door. Let's not make a big deal out of it. Mike? It's Michael, and what are you going on about? He's yours. Deception? Oh my god. Did you just inject Mountain Dew into my neck? And Kara then bashes Michael's head in with a metal pipe and Tommy finishes him off. They take off and Loomis says that he has other business to take care of. And when we go back inside, we see Michael's mask on the ground and we hear... <laughs> what I'm guessing is Loomis screaming? Oh no, there has to be a better way to honor his memory. Like editing him out completely. So like, that's it. This is the end of the main Halloween storyline. Kinda feel like story-wise, we're only about halfway there. Like Danny is still hearing voices and clearly has a compulsion to kill. Just like Michael, even though Michael is not his blood relative in any way, shape, or form. Alright, thanks for watching. And don't forget to watch the entire Halloween playlist. And again, like before, just start it and just, just let it run.